it started, I was approached by a man who owned a big studio in Clerkenwell, who worked a lot for Canal Plus in Paris. And Canal Plus had said to him they were interested in making a documentary about the death of a man called Louis Renault, about whom I didn't know. I'd obviously heard of Renault cars, but I'd not really heard about the founder. They asked me to have a look into it because they thought he might have been murdered by a communist cell while he was in prison. So I had a look into it. And uh, then I met this amazing man who owned Renault's house, who it turned out I'd known previously in, in a previous life in London, which is, you know, he bought this. Because the French have got this extraordinary habit of, they have these beautiful villas, a huge great thing. <clears throat> which the family will inherit. And the family have got a tendency to build a bungalow in the grounds and just leave the main house derelict and just, they fall down. These, you have these wonderful chateaus all over France that are just derelict because they're too much to maintain. Anyway, he bought this um, house which was previously owned by Louis Renault. I called him and, and he said, come and stay. And, and I went and stayed with him in, in Normandy. And it, the most beautiful house you've ever seen in your life. It's the most fantastic place. And Renault built it. And I just thought, well, why haven't I heard about this man, Louis Renner? And then I started looking into it, and it turns out that we are now talking about a man Henry Ford called the father of the motor car. This is a man who, who should be up there with Brunel, or, or he's the most amazing man. He's, the list of his achievements are profound, and every motor car on the planet is, uses his technology, some of it, even now. You know, he came up with the, the idea for it. He patented all this stuff, a differential, gearbox, shaft drive, because everything hitherto before Renault had been chain-driven. Big old things, big engine, inefficient. He created this wonderful little thing upon which Henry Ford's Model T was based. It was based on that original idea of Louis Renault's. And that's why Ford called him the father of the motor car, because you know, this is 1897. He built this car in 1897 in a place called Biancourt, which is a, a suburb of Paris, where his parents lived. And so I started looking into this extraordinary man and, and walking around his house, which is now owned by this guy, guy uh, David Salamone, who owns this house, a lovely guy. And underneath all the lawns are these wonderfully constructed tunnels. Uh, and the house itself is built on a, a cliff top, um, and there is a tunnel under the river, the same, upon which it's built. And he built a village over the other side of the river, into which he housed his engineers and lots of lovers as well, which is the most extraordinary thing. I mean, he's an amazing man, he's an extraordinary man. I, I could go on and on about this forever, but, I, but the, the political aspects is fascinating. In the First World War, he won the Legion of Honour, which is the only industrialist ever to have won the Legion of Honour first class, because of his contribution to the war effort. He, he created a revolutionary tank, which is still used in the Second World War. It was the most amazing thing, about which we never hear, but I'll go on to that and tell you why. The other amazing thing is that you can stop a, a kid in the street in, in Paris and say, have you ever heard of Louis Renault? And nobody knows of him. And this guy should be, and the, the reason that, I've, well, I found this professor of history at the Sorbonne who agreed with my findings, or, well, he came up with them before I did, that he was murdered, not by uh, communists, but he was murdered because of his assets. He was murdered by General de Gaulle. I mean, it, it wasn't by de Gaulle. De Gaulle didn't actually murder him, and he didn't give the instruction. But cause and effect suggests that that's what happened. He was arrested in 1944 for collaboration with the Nazis. Or he, he was, a, a warrant was issued for his arrest. And he was living in the south of France with a friend. And the, his lawyers said, look, to de Gaulle, he, he'll surrender, no problem, because he's completely innocent of this charge of collaboration but you must guarantee that you're not in prison then because we know what happens if you lock him up. Anyway, he was locked up, needless to say, and the magistrate said, whose quote I've got nothing to do with me, I've been told by de Gaulle to lock you up. So he was locked up 
and that was the last time anybody saw him, and he was dead. Day before he died, his assets, and he had 23 factories in France. This is probably one of the richest men in the world in the 30s. He had factories, he owned half of Acton. He built all the taxis that were built in this country. He built most of the taxis that were used in America in the 30s. He had factories in Long Island. He owned huge tracts of land in Long Island, all of which was seized by the state in 1944. Even though his brief had created this amazing case for the defense, which was never aired, no one ever saw it because he died. And then de Gaulle put a block on anybody discussing this for 20 years. So no one talked about Renault because it was, it was a taboo subject. And, Re and de Gaulle didn't want... And the, the way it worked was de Gaulle, towards the end of uh, the German occupation, the, uh, the early part of 44, middle of 44, um, just before the Allies landed, uh, they knew it was only a matter of time before they were kicked out. So this demonization of Renault started then in the British press to say that the guy was a collaborator. Now, Renault had won the Legion of Honor in the First World War. He'd fought the Germans tooth and nail, hated them, and had, would, had nothing to do with them. And, and all the documents that I've discovered proved that he would have nothing to do with the Germans. In fact, he sabotaged a lot of their work, but that was never relayed. He was murdered in prison, branded a collaborator. As a result of that collaboration, the state, the state seized all his assets, distributed his assets among the people that had objected to de Gaulle's taking over, which was all the uh, uh, resistance leaders. Now, the resistance leader in Paris became the managing director of the factory in Biancourt, and his son is now the managing director of the company, who I've spoken to. Now, he wants to, they all want to agree with what I'm saying, but obviously it shows an element of why would my dad have taken this job just purely for the money. But I suppose after four years of occupation and being brutalised and having no money, then somebody said, look, here's a great job for you. All you've got to do is, is accept this politician as being a governor of France. And that's what I think happened. And the whole of um, his assets were seized and they were divvied out among de Gaulle's erstwhile enemies. The Brits didn't want de Gaulle, the Americans certainly didn't want de Gaulle, but he usurped them by getting the press on his side or threatening the press. He arrived on the beaches in Normandy a few weeks after the Allies had gone through, but gave the impression that he was one of the first to come ashore at Normandy, branding his famous uh, baton as he walked up the beach, you know, without a gun, without any protection, but you know, all the cameras on him with a landing craft in the background. Everyone assumed that this is the first man, he's the liberator of France. He was the first to leave France when the Germans invaded. So, you know, let's, let's not kid ourselves here. Anyway, that's the official line. So, looking into it, I, I, I then took a, a crew around uh, Paris filming, because he owns houses all over Paris, into which he installed his lovers as well, under which, of course, he had tunnels to them all. Uh, the Bois de Boulogne is right next to the American Embassy. It's the most amazing building. I think he's now the Israeli Embassy, but it's, he owned that. And the uh, house in Herkerville, it's called, in Normandy, is just to die for. It's got... Um, these huge balconies overlooking the Seine with electric windows, and he had a, a lathe in his la in his dining room that he would stop at a dinner party and haul up this wonderfully carved chest in which was a lathe because he'd had an idea for a part for one of his new cars. And fortunately, he photographed everything. He he drew had drawings and done of every component and every car that he ever made from 1898, I think it was when they first started rolling off the production line, through to the to 44 when he got killed. So he'd, he'd got this wonderful archive, of which I've got all of it. The, the Renault board gave me this archive, or a, a VHS of the archive. So, uh, and they wanted to play ball. They wanted this story told, because it's, it's a, 
it's it's a national pride. You know, they they're all proud people to be. They're proud to be French, and they're even prouder of the man called Louis Reno, but they're not allowed to shout about it because even I interviewed some uh, some very elevated uh, counts and a few other people that were around were major players at that time, and they would talk in a hushed voice when I when I talk about Louis Reno. It wasn't a subject anybody wanted to talk about, and it's the, this professor of history at the Sorbonne, um, Emmanuel Chadeur who's now dead instantly, he died of cancer, um, said to me, as far as he was concerned, the thing that really made him cross was the fact that the French people couldn't celebrate probably the greatest Frenchman that ever lived, purely because of their political sacred cow in De Gaulle. But it's a fascinating story, and, and uh, it's beautifully documented because of the wonderful things that Renault did. He photographed every car, and, and there's lots of press about his contributions and the meetings. He met Hitler a couple of times in the 30s, but only at motor shows. He didn't, he didn't court Hitler. He loathed all that, and he didn't like politicians. You know, and and uh, he was he and Petain were the only people to well, were two of the main recipients of the uh, Legion of Honor in the First World War. And even Petain couldn't persuade Renault to help the Nazis. You know, even though they went back to, they had that pedigree, he wouldn't work with the Nazis and he loathed them and wouldn't have them anywhere near his factory. And, and when they did sequestrate his factory, which they did a, a couple of factories in Paris, he, ins he gave instructions for sabotage and they used to put sand in the bearings and, you know, it was a serious contribution and he dumped some precious metal in the, into the same, <clears throat> which is well documented. So, I mean, it's a farce that what he did, but De Gaulle owned the press, and and nobody wanted to put their head above the parapet then, because everybody thought, well, look, if I start supporting Renault, because they all wanted to say, look, you know, it's not him. Ford in Paris, in France, made more uh, uh, lorries for the Nazis than Renault ever did. You know, we we're not no, we're not told about any of this, but anyway. Um, so that is a program that I've filmed a lot of it because I did a lot of the interviews and I've done a lot of the research into where he was and I filmed lots of his, he did these amazing experiments on agriculture and he had these experimental farms in Normandy and the buildings that he built to house all these experiments I photographed and it's a very interesting subject, fascinating subject. Anyway, so I did that and I, we went back to Colonel Plus and said like, it wasn't a communist cell that murdered him in Friends Prison in the south of Paris. It looks like it was done by de Gaulle, and there was a shock and horror, and everyone said, uh, "No, I'm sorry, uh, we don't go down that route. We're not interested in that subject now." And they gave me the intellectual copyright of it because they paid me quite a bit of money to to make it, but they said, "We're not going there. You know, forget about it." So they gave me the intellectual copyright of it, and then uh, I had this call from um, Roman Polanski's producer, who bought me dinner at the. Um, uh, that hotel in the grounds of Chelsea Football Club there, you know, that uh, big see, mo modern thing. And um, we had dinner, and because I wrote an idea about making a film, about a feature film, about Louis Reno's, just the last few weeks of his life really spent, because he was in, under house arrest in his house in Normandy where this friend of mine, David Salamone, lives now. And it's the most exquisite building, and he's restored it back to its original glory. Um, but to tell the story of the collaboration, the supposed collaboration, and all the archive that I've got about his contributions to the victories in the First World War and all these wonderful machines he made and the tanks and the aeroplanes, he made aeroplanes as well. Um, it's, it's just a wonderful story. We could, you, you can, then the story of how the, the Germans sent delegations to him, to his house in, in Hergerville, to threaten him that unless you collaborate, you were going to move your factory, lock, stock and barrel, back to Germany. So you've got to collaborate. And he stalled them and made all sorts of excuses and said, right, they'll be on board now, we'll do something. And then he started sabotaging everything. It was a fascinating story, fascinating story. Anyway, so Kennel Plus said no. Anyway, and then um, uh, uh, Polanski said they, he wanted to do a feature film on it, but he wanted me to drop the Renault, the um, De Gaulle bit. But he bought an option on it for a year, so they bought an option. They didn't 
take it up. So I, I, that's come back as well. And that would be a fantastic subject. As a feature film, it, it would make a great idea. Because I know how to get hold of all the original vehicles as well, because they're all in running order. Some of them are beautiful. Some of them are amazing. Anyway, so that's a subject. But there is a documentary and a feature film there. So uh, that is that would make a great investment. 